Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my bed crimers, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing well. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out the channel. Let me just ask that after listening to and or watching the video, if you found you enjoyed it, please do me a favor, smash that like button. And if you want to support the work I do, please consider a Patreon membership. You'll find a link in the description. Now, let's dig in. An article in Newsweek published yesterday about the Idaho student murders included some tidbits of information that I at least had never heard before. The first one is that, according to this article, Madison Mogan was found leaning on Kaylee Gonsalves' shoulder when they were discovered in Maddie's bedroom on the third floor. I don't recall ever hearing that detail. The article goes on to talk about the K-bar and its leather sheath. It says that police speculated that the perpetrator may have been startled to find two women in the bed and that Gonsalves may have put up a fight during which the perpetrator was slightly injured and drop the sheath to the K-bar in the confusion. I've never heard that slightly injured bit. Of course, the way this is worded means that the police were speculating about how and why the perpetrator left the sheath behind on the bed. This article also talked about the white sedan that was seen on video speeding down the street very soon after the crime. The Moscow police saw that the car had no front license plate, so they took the video footage to an FBI officer who specializes in identifying vehicles. We knew that. This expert knew that there were regional differences in the same make of car. Sometimes a certain part may be used for cars sold in one part of America, but not in another. Did you guys know that? I didn't know that. The FBI agent, as we know, initially identified the car as a Hyundai Elantra made between 2011 and 2014 but after reviewing the footage over and over looking for small clues, he expanded his range from 2011 to 2016. And of course, we later found out that suspect Brian Koberger drove a 2015 Elantra. According to the article, Moscow police officer Brett Payne knew there were strong ties between Moscow, Idaho, and Pullman, Washington, and that students often traveled from one town to another to see each other. With that, the massive police search moved to Pullman. Search of CCTV footage from the college in Pullman and a private residence front porch video showed a white Elantra turning up about 10 minutes after the Elantra left Moscow, Idaho. What? This is news to me. We know that Koberger's phone was either in airplane mode or turned off between certain hours, but nobody ever mentioned the car turning up back in Pullman within 10 minutes. The article goes on to say that the Elantra drove through several Pullman streets before disappearing from view. And as we know, an officer in Pullman eventually identified a white Elantra belonging to student Brian Koberger. The article says, quote, from the driveway, the officer could see that the car had no front license plate. Once the police figured out that the Elantra belonged to Koberger and looked at his driver's license and saw that he had bushy eyebrows, as witness Dylan Mortensen had described on the man she observed walking out of the crime scene house on the night of the murder. The police got phone company records. To their dismay, Koberger's phone showed no record of being near the crime scene house on November 12th into 13th of 2022. The police felt that Koberger likely turned off the phone, switched it into airplane mode, or left it in Pullman to avoid detection. Side note, it's interesting that Barry Morphew's phone also found its way into airplane mode starting around the time his wife Suzanne stopped communicating with her phone and her friends and all the way up until around 10.30 that night. Coincidence? Back to Koberger. The article says that Koberger was placed under covert police and FBI surveillance and they discovered that he was going to be traveling back to Pennsylvania in that Elantra. 
The article then states that several teams were instructed to follow Kohlberger across America and to never let him out of their sights. We knew he was under surveillance at some point, but I've never heard it described as starting this soon once they figured out Kohlberger owned that white Elantra. Here's another interesting paragraph from the article. It says, quote, in an incident that is still clouded in mystery, a traffic policeman stopped Koberger's car and spoke to him briefly. The officer was wearing a body cam, and Officer Payne was quickly able to review the video footage and establish that Koberger had bushy eyebrows. It was important for police to see what he looked like in real life, and not simply to rely on a driver's license photo. We still don't know if this this was a genuine police stop, or given the speed with which the body cam footage was recovered, a police ploy to get a closer look at Koberger, end quote. The way this article describes the traffic stop, it sounds likely that this was a deliberate move by the cops to get their eyes on Koberger in the flesh to see those bushy eyebrows. Who knew eyebrows could take on a life of their own? Koberger's eyebrows are as notorious as he is. Per the article, when the sheath came back from DNA analysis, the authorities knew the DNA was from a male, but they didn't have Koberger's DNA to compare with what was found on the sheath. You'd think they could have gone to his office at Washington State University and grabbed maybe a pen or a stapler from his desk, but perhaps they didn't think they could get a search warrant at that point. Per the article, the cops didn't want to arouse Koberger's suspicion, especially as they wanted to see if he would dispose of the weapon somewhere on the drive across America. As far as they could tell, he did not dispose of anything along that that drive home. But of course, we know that at one point, the police tracking him lost sight of the Elantra. Could the K-Bar have been dumped at that point? We will likely never know. The article then talks about the major gaps in the investigation. It says the police are still stuck on a major question. Where is the K-Bar? We know the police are trying to see if Koberger purchased one online from Amazon. And if they can link a K-Bar to Koberger in this way, it will make their case against him significantly stronger. But according to former federal prosecutor Niema Ramani, the lack of a murder weapon does not sink the case against Koberger. Ramani is quoted as saying in the article, Prosecutors would love to have the murder weapon, especially any DNA on it, but it's not fatal to their case. They'll argue that Koberger is more sophisticated than your typical accused murderer and probably disposed of it somehow, end quote. Romani also said that Koberger's likely silence at trial may work against him, even though he is legally entitled not to speak. Romani said, quote, even though jurors are instructed that they can't infer guilt from the defendant's silence, implicitly it may have an effect. That's why we're seeing a trend with more defendants taking the stand, particularly in high-profile cases like Elizabeth Holmes and Alec Murdoch, end quote. Moving on to another new article about the case in Moscow, Idaho. This one comes from the series in Airmail News by reporter Howard Bloom. In the latest installment, Bloom shares that Kaylee Gonsalves' boyfriend, Jack DeCur, was given a lie detector test and also submitted to a DNA swab. Now, we probably could have surmised that that happened, but now we know for sure. And Ducur passed both exams with flying colors. Remember, Kaylee's phone records showed that she dialed him up many times in the early morning hours of November 13th, and all the calls went unanswered. Kaylee's father, Steve, found all of that suspicious, and even after DeCur passed the exams per the article, Steve remained suspicious of Jack. 
According to the article, when a grieving Jack DeCur showed up at the Gonsalves home not long after the events to pay his respects, Steve demanded that Jack lift his shirt and show his arms, neck, and hands. Steve was looking for telltale signs of scratches or bruises. Steve then took a series of photos of Jack. To him, this was now exculpatory evidence that might come in handy. There were no scratches or bruises on Jack. Finally, after all of that was done, Steve and Jack embraced. The article goes on to say that Steve then tracked down a student named Hunter Johnson, who was victim Ethan Chapin's frat brother and best friend. Just before noon on November 13th, Johnson had been called to the crime scene house by the two survivors, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk. Johnson discovered Ethan's body. Days later, Hunter told Steve Gonsalves what he saw. Only after Hunter was done telling Steve every Everything he witnessed in that house of horrors did both he and Mr. Gonsalves break down in tears. Steve Gonsalves also knocked on the doors of the houses and apartments adjacent to the house on King Road. He wanted to interrogate the neighbors for himself, but they didn't have any useful info. Steve was desperate for his daughter's case not to go cold, but he wanted to know why. Why were those kids targeted? Why that particular house? This is when Steve decided to speak out on the news and to make a public appeal for any and all info. This is also when he reached out to Olivia of Chronicles of Olivia, but apparently Olivia didn't respond because she didn't believe the email was really from Kaylee Gonsalves' father. Olivia reached out to Kaylee's sister, Olivia, she has the same name, spelled differently, to see if the email was really from her dad, and Olivia confirmed it was. It turned out Olivia of Chronicles of Olivia was in Moscow, Idaho at the time with her so-called producer, Bullhorn Betty. So that's when they went over to the Gonsalves' home for an interview. After Steve, his wife Christy, and their daughter, Olivia, poured out memories of Kaylee, Steve says that he wants to let the complacent authorities know what to expect from him. He's like, if they won't get the job done and find whoever committed this crime, then I will. And in his interview with Olivia, he asks the public for their help. Two days after that interview was posted online, a SWAT team of state troopers stormed into Koberger's parents' home in Pennsylvania. They had who they believed to be the perpetrator. The article in Airmail goes on to talk about how the one-year anniversary anniversary of the crime is coming up, and it talks about how the victims' families have been coping. It describes Zana's father, Jeffrey Kernodal, saying on 48 Hours, quote, This happened, you know? What do you do? You can't do a damn thing, end quote. And the article also describes how Ethan's mother and father have sought solace by setting up a foundation called Ethan's Smile that will award scholarships to honor Ethan but how Steve Gonsalves has found neither resignation, like Jeffrey Kernodal, nor solace and acceptance, like the Chapins. For Steve, Koberger's arrest has brought, quote, not a sense of finality, but only brooding resentments and further nagging questions, end quote. Now Steve's battle is to make sure the police have arrested the right man. We know Christy Gonsalves said she believes Koberger is the guilty party. Steve, however, said he remains open to the possibility that others might also have been involved. Per this Airmail magazine article, quote, it seems to Steve quite possible that there were more perpetrators in the house on King Road on the night his daughter and her friends died, and if there were, they must be at large. Steve is also furious that the trial has been postponed indefinitely, and he's incensed by the gag order that limits what the police, the lawyers, and the families can publicly say about the case. Steve feels this is a violation of his fundamental constitutional rights, and he feels that the lack of information shared by the police has led to rumors, 
half-truce, and crackpot lies. It sounds like Steve may still be investigating the case, looking for possible unidentified collaborators. Steve wants to understand the perp or perp motive, the why behind the crime. The article says that Steve got an enticing tip at one point from a source he described as a jailhouse snitch. The article reads, quote, it was a tale that offered to tie up all the loose ends of the case, and spurred on by that promise, both Steve and the private detective he had hired fanned out with their inquiries into several states, energized by the intoxicating possibility that he was on the verge of accomplishing what the professionals had failed to do. But in the bitter end, it was nothing more than an elaborate con, a malicious scheme to squeeze money out of a grieving family's misery. The experience was demoralizing, end quote. And apparently Steve was conned again. Here's what the article says, quote, a grainy light bulb cam video of the King Road neighborhood came his way that proved Koberger wasn't the lone killer. It was only after he went to some expense and hired a professional videographer to examine the recording that he conceded it was a fake. Then there was his decision to leak a time-stamped video of another vehicle tearing away from a street adjacent to the murder house just before dawn on the morning of the crime to one of the true crime internet sites. His logic was that it was very possibly game-changing evidence. It needed official scrutiny, but this video too was also deemed a fake. And in the end, his tangential role in its dissemination became a bit of an embarrassment, end quote. Per the article, Steve has come to the conclusion that a drug ring being behind the crime is ludicrous. The article reads, quote, no pro is going to rough up someone not knowing who all is in the house. There were, he pointed out, usually only three girls in the King Road house. His daughter, who had completed all her coursework, and would graduate in January, had just come down to Moscow for the weekend on a whim to show Maddie her new Range Rover. Explain to me how a hitman missed Ethan in Kaylee's new car. A professional would have been daunted by the presence of two additional people in the house that night. End quote. Steve has also been told by the authorities that toxicity reports on all four victims established that they had no drugs in their systems. Listen to this now. Steve assembled a team of an FBI agent in the St. Louis office who shared his personal email with Steve, a handful of sympathetic law enforcement officers, and a quote conduit to two of the grand jurors who were on the panel that voted to indict Brian Koberger. Through these people, Steve has come to some startling revelations. The article said that Koberger purchased a dark blue Dickies long-sleeved work uniform at the Walmart in Pullman, Washington not long before the crime. The authorities had a copy of the $49.99 receipt for this uniform. This helps to explain why, if Koberger is the perpetrator, he was able to escape the crime scene without a scratch and without leaving blood in his getaway car or apartment. Per Steve Gonsalves, Koberger wore the work uniform during the crime and then disrobed before he got behind the wheel of the Elantra, allegedly. I'm going to say allegedly because Koberger has not been found guilty. He's still presumed innocent. Now, I've always said that I thought that whoever committed this crime likely wore clothing that he took off before he got into the Elantra. And according to the airmail article, Steve and the authorities hypothesized that Koberger stuffed the work suit into a plastic garbage bag and then shoved it into his trunk. The only problem is that there's no sign of the Dickies outfit anywhere. The police have looked high and low and they can't find it. Of course, we know that Koberger went for some long drives and it's possible he could have buried that somewhere along the route. Per this article, the cops had a receipt for the K-Bar as well that Koberger had purchased online months before the crime, but this receipt per the article has seemingly vanished. What? This article makes it sound like the cops 
cops had a receipt showing that Koberger bought a K-Bar online, but then they lost it? That's how I'm reading it. Very interesting. The article goes on to say this, quote, even more troubling, if true, was what Steve had learned from people who had spoken to members of the grand jury who had been presented with the prosecution's case. It centered on the alleged behavior of the two roommates who had miraculously survived the night unscathed. How, he wondered, meaning Steve, could they have slept blissfully unaware through the savage pre-dawn crime against four people in a narrow house with paper-thin walls. Later, a police affidavit revealed that one of the survivors, Dylan Mortensen, had in fact heard noises and had left her room only to spot a masked, darkly clad intruder making his way through the residence before she retreated to her room and did not summon help for another eight hours for reasons that have never been revealed. Okay, so how that's written, it makes it sound like Dylan did more than peek out of the door, the way they say she retreated back to her room, then let hour after hour after hour tick away before they finally decided to summon friends. It added an entirely new band of mystery to a crime that was already bound by unanswered questions. And so Steve intensified his efforts to get answers, and in that process, he came to believe that the government must have a protected source an informant who could provide testimony that would tighten the screws that held together the case against Koberger. Steve was determined to talk to them. He did not want to wait for the trial to get the knowledge he needed. For his peace of mind, he needed relief now. And after some digging, he grew convinced he had the informant in his sights. He was preparing to reach out to this individual to get right in his face and confront him. He would explain that he was empowered by a father's natural right to fully understand the last moments of his daughter's life. In fact, it was his duty. It was an argument he felt that no one could reject. And at last he would know the whole story of what had really happened to Kaylee and why. But before he could make his move, before he could get in a room and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the witness, he was unexpectedly stopped in his tracks by the FBI. The FBI apparently sent an official letter to Steve's attorney, Shannon Gray, warning that if there were any attempts to contact the individual Steve had been pursuing, there would be legal consequences. The witness had originally reached out to the authorities through a tip line that promised to protect the identities of anyone volunteering information, and the Bureau was duty-bound to honor that commitment. The letter went on to say that the fact that Steve was the father of one of the victims gave him no dispensation from the legal consequences that accompany tampering with a government witness. Stymied, Steve skulked away. The promise of real understanding was out there, yet still tantalizingly beyond his grasp. And with this setback, he fell into a period of stasis. Racked by frustration and despair, all he could do was send a disheartened text to one of his fellow internet detectives, quote, there is so much more to this story than is in the media. End quote. The article in Airmail goes on to say this, Memories live in the past. Dreams, however, are part of an idealized vision of what the world might become. In dreams, as the poet noted, begin responsibilities. They hold the future. And so, thwarted in his sleuthing, still staring with bitterness at hard mysteries he cannot crack, Steve has expanded his focus. If he cannot conduct the investigation provoked by his memories of his daughter, he will at least ensure that at some distant appointed time, there will be a measure of justice. End quote. Guys, this article seems to support some of the rumors that have been expressed on places like Reddit and 4chan that the survivors were both allegedly awake and heard everything. I'm saying allegedly because this is all like hearsay. 
We're hearing it in this article in airmail, which apparently came from Steve Gonsalves, allegedly. So we have to take it all with a grain of salt that there is possibly someone who called in a tip that could explain everything that really happened. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. I don't know what to think at this point. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.